This is another I Raw podcast. We often think about violence as a harmful practice or relation. So somebody takes a knife and cuts me, that's violence. But we miss that actually what is violence is something else that is tied up with the tools of violence, which is the experience of a radically non-consensual act. That is often what violence is. Welcome back to The Animal Turn, everyone. This is season six, where we're looking at animals and politics. And in today's episode, episode four of the season, we're going to be talking about a really important concept, and that's violence. Now, of course, violence stretches beyond the political sphere, but it is an incredibly political act and a political concept. So today we focus on that. What is violence? What kind of scales does violence operate at? And how can we possibly begin to understand the relationship between animals and violence? My guest today, Dinesh Joseph Wadiwell, is the Associate Professor in Human Rights and Social Legal Studies at the University of Sydney. He is the author of Animals and Capital, as well as The War Against Animals, and he co-edited with Matthew Trulu, Foucault and Animals. Now, we talk about all three of these books at different points in the interview today. Primarily, we focus on the war against animals. And towards the end of the interview, we touch a little bit on Foucault and Animals, as well as Dinesh's just recently published Animals and Capital. They're all brilliant works and they sound super fascinating. He also co-edited Animals in the Anthropocene, Critical Perspectives on Non-Human Futures. He's a member of the Multispecies Justice Research Group at the University of Sydney and chair of the Australasian Animal Studies Association. If you haven't heard about this association, I encourage you to go and check them out. They provide a lot of resources and opportunities for young graduates and graduate students. I myself am a member and I'm a proud member of this organization. We talk a little bit about it at the beginning of the interview. And if it sounds of interest to you, definitely go and check it out. There are links to it in the show notes. In addition to all of this, Dinesh is also a disability rights researcher and has recently been part of a team of researchers who have produced reports on the Australasian Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability on Forced Restraints and Seclusion and Complaints Processes. It's a, it's a big mouthful, but in essence, he's done a lot of work on disability studies. And he is a fascinating scholar who's thought deeply about power relations, as well as about a variety of different ways in which violence operates. It's a theoretically dense conversation we have today, but it's an important conversation. And I think something that Dinesh does throughout the interview is say that we have to call things what they are. And if it's a violent act, or if it's an act of domination, we need to be able to communicate that. So this is why scholars have to focus on practices that involve violence. So I hope you enjoy the episode today. Hi, Dinesh. Welcome to the Animal Tone Podcast. Lovely to be here, Claudia. Fantastic having you with us today. And I know you're calling all the way from Sydney, right? You said you're in Sydney? Yes, I'm in Sydney at the moment. Awesome. I've never been to Australia. I do have some friends in New Zealand and I plan to visit one day soon. But I'm really delighted to have you on the show today to talk about what's a really important concept and one that's come up often throughout the show, but perhaps hasn't had significant attention paid to it in terms of what it is, and that's violence. So I'm hoping that today we can talk about what is violence, and more importantly, why is it important to think about violence in relation to animals and politics, uh, because that's the, the theme of the season today. But before we get into that, let's let's learn a little bit about you. You've done a lot of work in animal studies. You've done a lot of theoretical work. How did you come to be involved in animal studies? And maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Sydney. I've been at the University of Sydney for about 12 years. I'm a little bit of an unconventional academic in that I did a PhD in the late 90s, early 2000s. I submitted in 2005, but I didn't immediately go to work as an academic. In fact, I didn't really intend to become an academic. I was doing a lot of work in the not-for-profit social justice sector, largely doing work around anti-poverty and disability rights. Around 2009, 2010, I decided to transition to academia. 
And part of that reason was that I was writing a book, which the book happened to be The War Against Animals. I didn't have time to finish the book while I was, at that time, the CEO of a not-for-profit organisation. So I decided to make the switch to become an academic and luckily got a job at the University of Sydney. In terms of how I got to write about animals, that was also a little bit of a mistake or an accident. I trained as a political theorist. I was largely interested in contemporary European political theory and interested in the way that sovereignty had evolved in nation states and its relationship to violence. As part of my PhD, I spent a lot of time looking at relations of power and how contemporary states use violence to achieve domination or relations of power. And as part of that, I spent a lot of time looking at torture and its practice in the 20th century and beyond. In the midst of writing that, I started to think about animals. On a personal level, I had stopped eating meat for a long time. and In the back of my mind, I kept thinking that these theories of power and theories of violence that I was looking at were very applicable to how we treated animals. Yet in much of the mainstream animal rights theory I saw around me, I didn't see these accounts using these tools from political theory. So that's how I became very interested in that space and how I ended up writing about animals. You mentioned that I'm the chair of the Australasian Animal Studies Association, which I'm super proud to be part of. ASA is an organisation that has been in operation for probably about 17 years. I know someone might can correct me on this. It's a relatively new studies association. It has grown into, I think, one of the most unique scholarly associations of its kind in the world. And I, I, I confidently say probably the most dynamic and largest animal studies association globally. There's a number of really important animal studies associations, but what marks ACER out as different from other associations is that we have, a, we have members, so we, anybody can join. And I think we have close to 200 members now. Many of them are concentrated in the Australasian region, so New South Wales, I'm sorry, Australia and New Zealand. However, we increasingly have a global membership, so we increasingly have lots of scholars from around the world as part of the association, and that's made it very rich, very dynamic. We're a not-for-profit, so all the work that's done by ASA is donated and lots of people give up time. But we've grown more and more active, and I guess when COVID hit in 2020, we were really worried that, like many other associations and institutions, that we would suffer. But we actually went the other way. We had lots of people joining, lots of people interested in our online events. We have a conference happening later this year, which looks pretty exciting. And lots of people are turning up in Sydney to to come along to the conference. So I'm really pleased to be part of the association. It's an honour to be the chair. And we're looking forward to continuing to do some amazing work in coming years. I love I love the Australasian Animal Studies Association and I'm not in the region and I'm a I'm a member so I encourage listeners who are scholars who are interested in animal studies in general but I think I think ACE is also pretty good at having a, a critical animal studies lens um, maybe not all members abide to that but I think ACE is pretty impressive in terms of its commitment to to scholarship but also to cre- you know, creating scholarship that thinks about animals critically. Is that is that a fair assessment? I think it is. And I think it's maybe, a, maybe it's a relationship or it's something that has been shaped by the way that animal studies itself has changed in the last five to 10 years. I think when I initially joined ASA, it was much more diverse in the sense that you had animal welfareists on one side and animal rights people on one side and, you know, different, a range of different people doing different stuff. But I think that association, the ASA and animal studies itself, I think has changed a lot as a result of critical animal studies. So that some of the things that I think happened 10 or 15 years ago in the discipline no longer happened because of the strong work of critical animal studies scholars. And it's very hard to be doing animal studies and not pay attention to that work. 
So I think that has partly changed the way the association operates and most of our very active members in the association have a strong critical animal studies or animal rights approach. It doesn't mean that that's everybody, but certainly that's true for lots of the people who are very active in the association, which is really nice. I joined the discipline, let's call it, of animal studies when it was quite fractured and you had critical animal studies folk on one side of the world and, and broad animal studies elsewhere. I think in some ways we're seeing the discipline consolidate and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. And yeah, maybe it's one of these things of creating a false binary, but I've certainly I still feel sometimes that you, you have this, because animals are interesting to study. They're interesting to understand. And I think we've studied animals for a long, long, long time, even before kind of an idea of animal studies existed. Animals have been a, an object of scholarship. And I really do appreciate how critical animal studies scholars compels us to ask, I think, quite political questions, quite ethical questions. So I very much enjoy it and, and I'm grateful for its influence on the, the field generally. You mentioned a a moment ago when you were kind of talking about your own background in in animal studies, but in kind of finding your way in scholarship about animals, that you wrote The War on Animals. Now, that's probably one of your most well-known books, The War on Animals. Could you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. So The War Against Animals was my attempt to look at our relations with animals in a systematic way. So the book is effectively a structural analysis of our relations with animals. But to really pay attention particularly to questions around violence, coercion and domination, what struck me when I look at our relations with animals at a a global scale is that most of our relations with animals involve forms of violence or outright forms of domination. And this struck me as curious, sobering, upsetting on a global level. And what I found interesting was that when I looked at other analyses of our relations with animals, and typically from the traditional animal rights movement, we didn't see this sort of structural analysis. What are are the relations of power that circulate how we relate to, to animals? And if we're going to look at this from a kind of bird's eye view from globally, what does it tell us about our fundamental ways of being with other, other non-humans? From that perspective, I felt that there was a lot to say about both the extent of this violence, the intensity of it, and I'll, I'll talk more about this, but it's, it's intense in terms of its, its scale, but also how it is orchestrated but also the fact that we don't perceive this violence. And I find that also interesting, that we have systematic, wide-scale violence against animals happening across the globe, but we have systems of knowledge which actively obscure the fact of this violence. The book aims to just lay out the reality of this, and one of the findings of the book, which is in the title, is that one way we might describe this systematic violence against animals is to use the word war. I use the word war in a technical sense. So I draw from the the German theorist of war, Karl von Clausewitz, who Clausewitz makes this argument that war is a kind of violence that aims at domination. And from my perspective, I felt this is a very useful way to describe what we do to animals. We don't exert violence towards animals without any particular goal. The goal is very clear, it is to achieve domination, that is to enable animals to be used for our interests, not for their interests, for our interests. So from my perspective, it was useful to say, well, we do have a word for mass-scale corporate violence against others, and this word is war. And the book seeks to just systematically describe what are the unique contours of this war that we have against animals. And from that perspective, think about strategics, the strategy that we might use as animal advocates to try and counter this this ongoing conflict. That's fascinating because, you know, when I was doing research for for the episode today, I I kind of did a general search of violence in animals. And I had had an idea in my mind of what I would come across. You know, I, I thought I would come across maybe some of the typical animal rights 
imagery of of factory farming, etc. But what I ended up with was actually an account of these these kind of one the connection between violence against animals and child abuse that seemed to be an interesting kind of finding that came up immediately and two that animal violence or violence directed at animals was often called cruelty and not violence and i thought that that was really interesting could that kind of difference between calling violence directed at animals cruelty instead of violence is that part of this kind of discursive move that you're talking about where we just make we make the violence seem normal somehow i think it's interconnected so one thing i'd say when when i started writing the book was that one thing i noticed was that violence as a word which is a very important word in political science political theory violence as a word was never used in particularly accurate precise or repeatable ways within animal studies discourse so broadly and I'll get to this in a moment we don't often see animals as victims of violence and I, I would argue that this is an epistemic problem and I'll talk about this in a moment but interconnected with this there are other words that are used in its place and these potentially mean something different in their context so in often in legal contexts Cruelty is used as a word to describe acts of violence against animals that are deemed by the law and particularly animal welfare law to be non-permissible. So often in a legal context, mass scale violence against a pig in a factory farm, that's okay, or pigs in factory farms is okay. But treating a dog in the same ways in the family home is treated as cruelty. And that's where that word cruelty will emerge. So cruelty is actually selective in animal welfareist law in the way that it is applied. My use of the word violence is quite deliberate because to me violence expresses something that might happen whether or not the law agrees it is violent. And often related to what I described from von Clausewitz, violence aims at domination. And to me there's something interesting about consistently using the word violence in that it gets out of this idea that maybe there's some forms of violence that are okay or you know in the worst imaginings forms of violence that we imagine the victim actually wants or invites against this I want to say no no let's call violence what it is violence it might be that different legal regimes will tolerate particular forms of violence or even validate socially validate some certain forms of violence but as a political theorist I want to say we need to be consistent in calling violence what it is, violence. So you mentioned there that we often don't tend to think of animals as victims of violence. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so let's, I mean, if we think about this from the history of social movements, many social movements as part of their, let's call it politics of recognition, have sought recognition for forms of systematic violence that they experience that society does not treat as violence. So if we, to give you one example, lots of work of feminists is aimed at highlighting the systematic ways that women experience violence in a society that often validates or ignores or treats that violence as benign, natural, as to be accepted. So lots of the work of feminist theory is precisely saying, no, no, this is you know, this, this form of treatment is actually violence. In the area that I do some research work on, which is around disability rights, there are similar problems in that space where many forms of institutional treatment of people with disability is explained away by legal regimes or social convention as care, as justifiable treatment. But again, if we're frank about it, and disability movements are typically frank about this, these are actually forms of violence. What we notice here is that one of the strategies of violence is to treat the object of violence as an object who does not, cannot be violated. So this almost is one of the ruses of violence, the way that violence works, is to construct the object of violence as a subject who cannot experience violence and therefore erase the fact of this violence as a strategy. 
And I, I would argue we see this particular strategy of violence across different fields. In the space of animals, of course, this is standard. I, mean, I think it's almost, it's routinely standard that the law, social institutions, social conventions and cultures will imagine that animals do not or cannot experience violence and even at its worst will visibly see animals experiencing violence but register this as something else, as not violence. It's for this reason that I think epistemology is important to consider. So in The War Against Animals, I describe three different ways to think about violence. One example of violence I would call individual or intersubjective. So if one individual punches another, this would be an example of an intersubjective form of violence, so a, an act of violence against another person that reflects, you know, might reflect harm or might reflect a non, a, an act of, of non a non-consensual act. A different form of violence would be something that would be structural or institutional. So where a set of institutions collaborate to, to reproduce violence, whether it's physical, mental, psychological, whatever it is. Here the individual is less in the focus, but institutions, practices, collectivized and systematically work against an individual or groups of individuals. But the third level of violence I describe in the book, which I think is very important when we think about animals, is epistemic. So when I refer to epistemic, I'm talking about our knowledge systems. Our knowledge systems allow us to look at the world in particular ways and to see individuals as either full rights-bearing individuals or some sort of entity that lacks those rights and dignity. We know that a kind of hierarchical anthropocentrism dominates our society where most animals are treated as beings who are not granted full recognition. And of course this means that these individuals can be subject to forms of violence and we don't see them as experiencing violence or as subjects of violence. Here again, we see this sort of this trick of violence or the strategy of violence, which is often, as I said, to systematically construct the object of violence as somebody who cannot be violated. And I, I think we see this directly in play in lots of different spheres of, of our treatments with animal, treatment of animals. So one example, one, one extreme example is something I talk about in the book is the, the pictures you see in butcher's shops. So some of the most horrific ones are a smiling cow with a knife in their hand cutting their own body. And this, this to me illustrates a kind of the full extent of the epistemic erasure of the reality of the animal as a subject of violence. In this case, the animal is actively participating and enjoying violence against themselves. And I think I mean, I've taken an extreme example, but we actually see lots of different examples of this. So animal agriculture produces, while subjecting billions of animals to what I would describe as a living hell, will actively say that these animals are cared for, that they even maybe want this form of treatment, that we cannot imagine a better form of life than what we give these animals. And that, to me, is an example of this epistemic erasure. That erasure, of course, removes from sight the fact that we actually have billions of targets of violence or billions, maybe billions of victims of violence that have been placed in those facilities through human interests. And to me, that stepping away from the epistemic violence is actually one of the hardest things to do because it's deeply ingrained in our cultures and ways of looking. But when we do so, of course, we start to get closer to the truth of the relations of power before us, and they're confronting, right? And that's partly why I called the book The War Against Animals. It is intended to highlight what I think is a confronting reality that we have in our midst. So so you mentioned now there are kind of three, I guess, almost scales of violence, and, and I would assume that they're interconnected, right? The interpersonal violence that you can have. I mean, you could imagine this operating at a scale, so to to 
build on what you were saying about factory farms, you could imagine the interpersonal violence of a factory farm worker and the animal and that there is a certain amount of beating and interpersonal violence happening perhaps between those two. You could think about the institutional um, or, or structural violence, both of the factory farm worker and of the, the, the animal in that institution. Oftentimes factory farm workers are subjected to a whole host of structural violences that put them in, in a factory farm setting in the first place as workers. And animals are subjected to breeding programs, to, you know, to, to a whole host of profit motives that get them there. And that's part of this kind of structural idea. But then what makes this whole thing operate in the first place is the base at which is this epistemic violence, the idea that there are jobs that some people will just have to do because they can't do anything else, and that there are animals that will have to die because we have to eat, and it just is what it is. And this idea of it just is what it is is a an epistemic justification for what are really unjust, unequal, and violent practices. Is that a good kind of summation of how these might be interconnected? It's an excellent summation. The only thing I'd say is that there isn't a hierarchy or a base, or in my view. I would actually argue that we need to see it as something like a circle, in that one, one sphere of activity feeds the other, feeds the other, and goes around in a circle. So if we think about the factory farm, there's a direct or interpersonal form of violence, which is the, the human workers, or I'd actually say machines and enclosures, directly exerting forms of violence or coercion against non-humans, which produces a form of domination in that space. But it happens in a context, and this is where we step back to the institutional structural. The context is, of course, billions of animals have been positioned by our societies to become sources of subsistence for human populations. And we have used, through intensification, mechanised means and forms of technologies and enclosures, mass-scale forced reproduction to make this happen. And this, this is the context by which it, 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 it all happens. But finally, there's an epistemic level which is on one hand the, the big picture is a hierarchical anthropocentrism that now pervades most societies globally and positions animals as below, less worthy than most human life and subjects as a result of this hierarchy animals to forms of erasure and violence and sometimes almost imagines that, imagines that animals invite this violence as if the best way to treat these animals is through this violence. The three things go together in a kind of circle. So each mutually reinforces the other. Arguably, this epistemic worldview allows the worker to constrain the animal. And of course, there's lots of accounts of workers resisting or feeling not okay about having to be the ones that do this. But remember, they are just cogs in a larger machine which is the institutions or the structures that reproduce this. Those structures are fundamentally built on, this, on the epistemic building blocks. In fact, they, there's this relay between those, the epistemic level and institutions and structures that mean that constantly to justify this you know, multi-billion dollar global kind of structure of violence, you're going to need the, the knowledge system there. So I would argue that we're not talking about a base and superstructure in a Marxist sense or a hierarchy, that it is actually a circle and it mutually reinforces, each mutually reinforces each other. From my perspective, the reason why I think this is important is that we can't just attack one part of the story. If we want, if we want change, in my view, we need to be constantly aware of the three levels. And so, you know, and people who follow my work will know that I would argue that each of those offers opportunities that allows us to make change, but we need to keep the others in view. So, you know, I, I'm very much in favour of us, of animal advocates, for example, working with trade unions in animal agriculture, but we have to keep in mind the realities of the structure. This is a large-scale capitalist industry driven by profit that is interlocked into our economies and 
apparently locked into planetary survival for the human humans, but also this epistemic level that our knowledge systems have to change if we want change. And the changing knowledge systems is huge work, right? So we'll need to be operating at all, the, all those levels if we want change. I think, I mean, sometimes I think this is where some of the challenges with animal welfare versus animal rights emerges, right? Because you'll have a focus on improving, I guess, what are some of the physical violences that animals face in these settings without necessarily challenging that that knowledge violence. I mean, and you might view, and, and perhaps this is part of what you're saying, maybe, maybe there is a move where as you reduce the physical violence, you're contributing to reduction in epistemic violence. But my, my gut tells me that sometimes if we make the physical violence seem more palatable, that we might be entrenching or deepening some of the epistemic violences. I think that's spot on. And I would certainly make the same argument that much of the innovation in animal welfare, unfortunately, and so, by the way, I'm, I don't necessarily buy into the hard division between animal welfare and animal rights. Because it might be that there are forms of animal welfare reforms that help us towards the goal of, let's call it liberation of animals. These might be welfare reforms that operate on both the intersubjective and the epistemic line and seek to reform industries, right? But I would argue that certainly lots of the forms of animal welfare reforms that we've seen have actually worked in concert with actually some of the forces that we see that maintain the domination of animals. So capitalism will find ways to make this industry more palatable. You'll find ways to speed production and reduce friction. And sometimes some animal, animal welfare reforms do precisely this work. They assist to make capitalism or capitalist animal agriculture more effective. So maybe to give you one example that I discuss in both The War Against Animals, but I, I talk about in later work, including the book that is about to come out, Animals and Capital. One example is the curved corral that was developed for slaughterhouses. So in many slaughterhouses, traditionally, you had a straight chute that led to the stun gun. And for some animals who perceived what was going to happen, they would balk and stop and this would create an inefficiency in production. The curve corral was developed to supposedly as a welfare measure to reduce distress for animals by introducing this gentle curve that hid from sight the final destination. No surprise, this spared production and animal welfareists will say, oh, this is a good thing that we introduced this. But of course, it do didn't do anything to change the epistemic structure. It didn't do anything to change individual actions. All it did was actually speed production and make it more efficient and I would say increase or complete the domination of animals used in those facilities who were otherwise resisting their own, the violence that was being imposed upon them. So here I think this is an example of the way that animal welfare could be used in ways that actually don't change any situation. But I wouldn't, hold, I wouldn't take a strong stance and say, therefore, no animal welfare reforms are capable of radical change. I actually think maybe there are, and maybe we need to be thinking, if we're thinking along those different levels, maybe there are ways we can imagine apparently modest reforms starting to do work in challenging hierarchical anthropocentrism, challenging the way that individual forms of violence ha happen, and also challenging the structure. I really appreciate your nuance because sometimes we, including myself, tend to speak in this or that kind of ways. It's this way or it's that way. But I mean, things are often messier than that and require different kinds of interventions and deep thought about what, what interventions mean. And as you kind of said, thinking across these three levels, holding that intention. And I, I appreciated what you said there about the curved, you know, the curved shoot Oftentimes people think, okay, well, we're reducing the anxiety of the animal who's approaching their impending death. At least they're not anxious about that. But maybe removing that anxiety or the the, the choice to resist is, a, like you say, another form of domination. It's, it's, it's removing their their ability to choose, even that small option of choosing to, to resist in that moment. You've mentioned now a couple of times 
domination. And obviously, domination has a pretty intimate relationship with violence. What do you mean when you say domination? When I say domination, I, I mean a relationship, typically a one-sided or unilateral relationship, where one party seeks to achieve almost universally their own interests over another party. So typically, like if we think about war, one goal of war is to subdue, subdue an enemy party and make that party conform to the interests of the, the victor. Um, we see in, on an interpersonal level domination happening in different ways. And I would say that, for example, I think lots of feminist theory, particularly radical fem the radical feminist tradition, theorised domination and pointed out that at the centre of patriarchal relations were relations of domination, i.e. the violence that women experience or in a gendered system, the violence that's inherent to the gendered system, reproduce particular relations that maintained the domination of men over women. So to me, this is a very useful description of how power relations can form within societies. It's also useful because it highlights the role of violence and coercion in producing states of domination. So in my view, violence and coercion in many cases don't just happen as accidents. The goal is to create a state of domination. When we see our treatment of animals ranging from how we treat animals in the factory farm to research labs to some forms of recreation to even companion animals, we see systematic forms of violence which aim at precisely at domination, at ensuring that the behaviours, the comportment, the movements, everything of this animal conforms to human interests. So in The War Against Animals, I talk a bit about companion animals, which are hard. it's hard to talk about because, of course, many of us engaged in relations with companion animals. But to me, as a political theorist, it's important to pay attention to the frank relations of power that circulate what happens with companion animals. What strikes me about when we look at companion animals is that in many cases, and particularly the case for dogs in urbanised contexts, we use systematic controls over movement. Usually many, many dogs will be enclosed most of their life. We strictly control forms of sociality with, with other animals. It gets worse and worse in urban contexts in that, you know, unless you have an off-leash park nearby, many dogs will spend their life directly being constrained by their owners on a leash or in a house, have very few opportunities to actually interact with other animals. We use forms of strict reproductive and sexual controls over animals so that these animals will never have the opportunity to reproduce in ways that I'm going to use natural in, in inverted commas, in natural ways, will never have the opportunity for a sexual life. And we, we make a decision to constrain that in for our interests. These animals will have strict control over the food that they eat, will have forced medical and other interventions as part and parcel of their life. And in some cases, when they die, will be a decision made by the owner. So from my perspective, when we look at this, this is, again, another sphere where violence aims, and these are all acts of violence and coercion, aim at almost complete control in the name of human interests. And again, I would describe this as domination, that that is domination, right, where, where being does not have the capacity to express themselves, do not, does not have the capacity to, on an equal basis, have some say about what happens in their life. That to me is domination. Yeah, companion animals or pets, which might perhaps better express that kind of domination and paternalistic uh, relationship. They've come up several times in the season. Angie Pepper and I actually spoke a fair bit about them as well. 
because it is it is really a pervasive and it's it's one I think that cuts to to our heart because we we think of ourselves as you mentioned earlier as caring and loving these animals and it makes me think of of dominance and affection and how we we hold these these two kind of ideas in our mind at the same time oh we care and we love for them but at the same time like you say if you look at all of this the 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 restriction of movement the control of reproduction etc etc how is it anything but domination and it can perhaps be both of these things i think the the contradictions in how we think about our relationships with each other and with animals we we don't think of through these contradictions and the significance of them for the animals involved and you've now spoken i think about two kind of really big often violent structures involving domesticated animals so factory farms on the one hand and the keeping of pets on the other hand in preparing for this, again, I did a search about violence in animals, and one of the kind of realms that came up was violence in animal societies, so violence that animals commit against one another. And I imagine that this is often a red herring that people will bring up when you mention your kind of work, so this is not my intention here, but I'm interested in thinking how that's featured in your thoughts about violence. Do you ever look at and think through how other animals commit forms of violence against other animals? Or is this a space where violence should not be used discursively? No, I don't I don't at all imagine that violence committed by animals against other animals is beyond analysis or that the word violence shouldn't be used in that context. Maybe one way to that might help with this is in the the final chapter, well second last chapter of the war against animals, I looked at the philosopher Jacques Derrida's final lectures that he gave in the last two years of his life, and they've been published under the title The Beast and the Sovereign. And in those lectures, he makes, I think, quite a remarkable observation about violence and its relationship to sovereignty. So a lot of the book deals with questions of sovereignty, and a part of it is looking at the way sovereignty might be useful as a political concept when we think about animals. And this is partly building on the work that others such as Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker have done in relation to animal sovereignty. In this book, in this, these lectures by Derrida, he makes this observation that all life is kind of violent. The, the way that life, if we think about it philosophically, in order to survive, all life has to exert a kind of violence against other life around it in order to preserve. And he says, you know, this is, of course, one way to look at relations around us is that we're in the midst of this pool of almost endless violence in order to for beings to survive. But Derrida makes this observation that, I'm going to misquote it, so I'm not directly quoting it, but something like that only humans make this claim that their violence is justified. It's only humans that make this claim that this violence therefore legitimates them as sovereigns. And to me, there's something interesting about this. It's that maybe it is true that our particular, I would say, European enlightenment conception of anthropocentrism that we've inherited, this hierarchical anthropocentrism that we're living in the midst of, imagines that the violence that we exert against animals is justified and it is because we believe we are the top of the tree we're at the apex of the tree and this gives us the right to do what we do and maybe this is this singular arrogance is quite unique to us so i just say that i don't have i don't write a lot about violence in the wild or in nature but i just say that i think there's something interesting about how the hierarchical anthropocentrism we have is tied to the kind of legitimization and veneration of the violence that we do, that we perform against animals as effectively enshrining ourselves at the top of the tree as, as, as the, the apex predator, if you like. And this is maybe one way to look at this is that we're partly attacking this idea, this conceptualization, the way that you know, because this hierarchical anthropocentrism that we are in the midst of isn't just about the pernicious effects this has on 
our relations with animals. It's actually about the planet. Right? I mean, if you're going to understand anthropogenic climate change, this hierarchical anthropocentrism pre precisely describes an attitude to the planet which would willingly take a wrecking ball to the planetary system so that we survive, that we, we can yeah, make money, do whatever it is that we want to do to meet our own interests. So to me, there's something interesting in unpacking that and maybe also noticing that we don't have other species running around claiming that they're superior and <laughs> devastating the planet and it's, it's us, right? So, so to me, there's something interesting in unpacking that and pointing out maybe there is something unique about what we're doing to animals. The second observation I'd make is that, and you're right, that it's a bit of a red herring argument and people have made that argument to me. Just because violence against, you know, violence might happen in animal communities doesn't mean that we need to use systematic violence. So I would say that all, all, all animals, all beings have their own cultures. We have to accept that our culture is one based upon mass scale violence, not just against animals, but against the planet, right? Against nature itself. And that's, it's not an accident that we've arrived at this place. There are many cultures historically and still today that maintain very different relationships with the planet. But there's something about our mainstay relations which is, as I'd say, utterly pernicious and we need to change or we and maybe many species or many beings on the planet will not be able to survive unless we make these changes. There's also just a final thing I'd say which is about violence itself as and its relationship to justice. For whatever reason, we've arrived at a point in large-scale cultures where I think for good reason we're intolerant towards the idea of violence as a necessary part of relations with others. It doesn't mean that, again, and when I say that I'm aware of the hypocrisies, right? I mean, we, we say that we don't want violence in our life, but if you ask feminist theorists, they'll tell you that violence is everywhere and structures relations between men and women or underpins the gender system. If you look at some of my older work around the practice of torture globally, there's lots of theorists of torture who say that from the 20th century on, we see an explosion in the use of torture that maybe is unprecedented in human history. But I'd also say we have narratives that problematize violence in a way that we've never seen before, that maybe are historically without precedent. And it means that justice is in part about reducing or completely eliminating violence from our everyday affairs. And to me, there's something positive about this frame for thinking about animals, because to me, actually, lots of the, the goals of animal advocacy, maybe even if they're naive goals, are about eliminating violence against animals. That's precisely what we're trying to do. And I don't, just as we would sign a treaty that says we should eliminate violence against women or people with disability, I similarly think we should be making the argument very clearly that what we, what our goal is, is to eliminate violence against animals. And what I mean by that is the direct and maybe some forms of indirect violence that human societies perpetrate against non-human animals as part of our, what we do. I think what you say is exactly right, that we need to look at our own house a little bit first. How do we start looking at other animal cultures and societies and saying, oh, they shouldn't do that? And when we are not looking at our own structures and our own ways in which we practice violence and systematically practice violence in a whole host of frames, including factory farming, pet keeping, but also, like you say, I think some of the actions we take that impact wild animals as well, the uh, you know fragmentation of habitats is a form of violence, the removal of an animal's home. Just this morning I saw clips of orangutans that are completely starving because they just don't have access to their food sources anymore and their same kind of social structures. And I think that kind of hubris to go in and take and destroy an environment again for our own purposes and desires and wills is a is a is a form of violence. Yeah, I think that's right. It's an it's an area of scholarship I'm aware of and I'm also a little bit cautious about. That said, I think there are some, I think, important and thoughtful thinkers in the space. And someone like Oscar Horta, who I really admire his work, who I think makes a I think makes a valid point in that 
he he makes he makes the argument that we firstly we treat nature as kind of off guard uh, off bounds for for justice thinking and we again i think there's no reason to imagine that nature is outside of what we imagine as a space of justice and that this may modestly shape how we respond to nature so one example that horta gives is that in a a situation of mass humanitarian disaster we've seen this with the global wildfires for example maybe it's reasonable for us to be taking into consideration what is happening to animals in nature and responding right just as we would respond to humans in distress and I, to me that's a really obvious suggestion and it starts to work against this hierarchical anthropocentrism that that I, I mentioned before but whether this you know whether humans should be you know eliminating predators or doing those sorts of things that i know that some of the theorists have been debating i don't know and i'm nervous about but i certainly think that with i i don't think nature should be exempt from thinking about justice and i don't necessarily think that we shouldn't intervene into natural systems because we're already doing it anyway and i think oscar horta makes this argument anyway all that said as you note we've got a lot of stuff to do in our own house and even just producing a consistent approach for how we direct our own force violence coercion towards animals it, we've got a long way to go so i guess for me that's the priority it's the priority of my work so i acknowledge that some of these debates are potentially intellectually interesting and they might help to shape or, or or challenge this sort of hierarchical anthropocentrism that we've inherited and and i think it speaks to perhaps some of the you know thinking through the the epistemic violences what you gave there is the kind of humanitarian offering i think the fact that we don't have maybe universal ideas on how we respond to animals in face of mass massive environmental disasters i think that's that's a massive oversight of international relations because and it points to again how they're absent in our in our views as individuals and as beings that require attention so i think that that's a really beautiful example so just as a perhaps a little bit of a an overview i know at the beginning you spoke now about there are almost different scales of violence you've got interpersonal violence institutional and structural violence but also epist- epistemological or epistemic violence you've got different types of violence you've got physical violence we we didn't really speak much about it today but there's forms of you know sexual violence there's psychological violence there's a whole host of different violences that both humans and animals can experience but one that we've looked at i think a fair bit in today's episode is kind of this the banal violence the the violence that we're willing to just accept as being normal and like you say in square scare square quotes scare quotes and uh, natural so violence is clearly a, an extremely complicated and complex concept but before i give you an opportunity to read your quotes i just want to bring this back to the theme of politics why is having this kind of understanding of uh, the scales of violence the different forms of violence why is this important when talking about animals and politics that's a great question i think it is because violence is a fundamental building block of political theory so it's an important concept within political theory and i would say it's it's largely been under theorized in the animal space so because it because this word hasn't been used and if we read the kind of early animal rights work in from animal ethics largely this word is not it does not appear it is not used and i think to me that this is a useful word for political theorists there's also a different question which is how do we understand violence right and even that debate around what what is violence actually animals allows us to understand or looking at animals allows us to understand that debate in different ways so to give you one example we often mistake the form of violence with what violence actually is itself so to 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 make that clearer we often think about violence as a harmful practice or relation so somebody takes a knife and cuts me that's violence but we miss that actually what is violence is something else that is tied up with the tools of violence which is the experience of 
a radically non-consensual act. That is often what violence is. So if you've experienced violence, and I hope, listeners, you haven't, it's this horrible feeling of a radical form of non-consent is the moment that you lose control, somebody else takes control, relations become radically one-directional, and there is no escape at that moment of violence. And to me, that is what violence is as a relation. Different tools are used to make violence happen, but as we know from lots of analyses of violence, sometimes you don't need a tool. Maybe an individual has so much power over, an in, over another that they're able to, through psychological manipulation or whatever means, coerce that individual into a relation of violence. So to me, it allow, thinking through violence as a political relation forces us to think about what is, it, what, what is the form of violence in this particular context? And we start to see with, with animals, actually, there are lots of unique forms of violence that are used against animals that don't necessarily have a replica in human affairs. But we understand them as violence because of that relation, because literally for animals there is no escape. It is a one-directional relationship that, that we, we're looking at. And for that reason, I would call those relations relations of violence. It makes me think, coming back to, to pits again, that makes me think about domestic violence, but perhaps in a different way, you know, and, and, and I don't want to make a problematic comparison here, but domestic violence is pervasive and people who have been in domestic violent spaces, particularly in the home, know that it pervades the way you think, it pervades the way you can move, it pervades the way you listen to the person who has control over you and, and your sense of safety in your own space. And again, like, and I'm making this comparison as someone who has come from a, a, of a, a history, <laughs> I've never said this on the podcast, but I, I grew up in a, a home and a family where there was overt domestic violence and it shapes the way you view the world and the way in which you think you can and cannot do and just what you said there is bringing animals in makes me think about pet keeping and domestic violence in, in a new way. And, and even just creating that juxtaposition, whether it's a fair juxtaposition, whether it's an ethical juxtaposition, suspending those questions for a moment, just juxtaposing them, makes me think about pet keeping and the, the structural violences of pet keeping in a, in a very different way, perhaps because I'm able to, to relate to it in a... In a um, in a, in a personal way. So I think what you're saying is exactly right, that the more we look at animals and take seriously the violences that they, they face, call a spade a spade, as you've, as you've kind of been saying, let's call it what it is, the more I think we can take seriously and respond in ways that are, 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 are more ethical, maybe not perfect, but are, are ethical and, and thoughtful at the very least. I think that makes sense. And the comparison is not without its merit. I just say that, in a way, even the idea of domestic violence, and some feminist theorists have pointed this out, the, the idea of domestic violence is also a bit unstable, if we think about it, because it, it refers to a kind of violence that only makes sense because of this ruthless private-public split and because of the failure, systematic failure, or actually sometimes endorsement of the law to grant powers to some individuals within those so-called domestic private contexts. But if we, if we look at relations with animals using just the tools that I've just laid out there, it allows us to get, to get a particularly interesting take on the role of the domestic sphere when it comes to animals because I would say that whether we like it or not, the law grants life and death powers of domination to individuals within do the domestic sphere over animals. Now, lots of those animals have comparatively reasonable lives and sometimes wonderful lives. I say that as well, knowing that lots of, I've known lots of fantastic animal rights activists who've rescued animals and given them amazing lives, right? So I don't, I don't mean to take away from that work. But we have to acknowledge that actually the law and society have produced the domestic context as a site of containment and coercion and granted individuals, human individuals within that space, 
sometimes quite absolute powers of life and death over those those beings in that space. And again, I'm not saying that I'm not even putting an ethical gloss on these questions because in some cases this might be the best life this animal may have in in relative terms. But from a standpoint as a political theorist, we need to be frank about this is what's going on here, right? I'm pointing to the, the, the structural dimensions. I think there is something to be said about you know, an animal who's in a shelter who will die regardless, you know, if 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 they're not in your home. And these are these are fraught and difficult, but speaking to what structures allow this in the first place, what what structures have animals and shelters in the first place, you know, breeding programs, et cetera, we need to talk to. And so often in this conversation about, I think, animals in the home, we focus on, you know, dogs or cats. But I think sometimes the forms of violence that you're speaking about here can be made even more apparent if we focus on other animals, such as uh, fish. I think uh, fish in the home experience an intense amount of violence. You see fish in pet stores being sold, and there's a single fish. These are often really social animals, a single fish in a single tiny little plastic glass that hasn't been washed. And then they come home and they get put in a tiny little bowl or a fish tank with an artificial environment. And if they die or the people don't want them anymore, they just get flushed down the toilet. And of course, there are variants as to what I'm saying, but I think the 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 kind of lack of thought that comes with animals such as fish um, points directly to what you're saying here in terms of epistemic violence. And I think fish feel this in many ways because of maybe some sort of mammal bias that we're not as attuned to understanding the ways in which fish experience pain or the ways in which fish need stimulating lives. So, yeah, I just wanted to flag that there, that so often we think of animals in the home as being cats and dogs, but there are a whole host of animals in the home that experience a, a variety of different interventions into into their lives. No, I think that's that's spot on and it relates to the epistemic dimension, as you say, and something I, you know, I do a fair bit of work on fish and a point that I've made is that there's something curious about the fact that we kill and use more fish than any other being on the planet, yet animal rights theory itself has had so little to say about that treatment. So to me there's something interesting, animal welfare and animal rights theory had so little to say about this. So this tells us the deep epistemic effect of the way that we've hierarchized certain animals that that matter and also treated some animals as almost being impervious to being the status of a victim of violence. Yeah, that, that comes exactly back to what you were saying earlier about them being objectified. I think fish are so often objectified in, in almost complete ways where because they seem so different to us. And I think these conversations are happening more and more. I think these conversations are happening now with regards to octo octopuses, octopi, but they're almost a charismatic animal in some ways. I think people really appreciate the complexity of, of octopi. But a goldfish, you, you look at the kind of history of, of domestication or what David Nybert would call domestication, I think, which is a really useful concept for thinking about the, the violence of domestication and domestication practices just what goldfish have gone through, the fact that their physical bodies are stunted, they cannot grow to the size they should be or want to be because of the containers they're kept in is just, and, and that most people don't even know that, that that's not even a thought or consideration is, yeah, like you say, it's a, it's a really a form of complete invisibility, an, an epistemic invisibility that we, we, we don't attend to as much, even as folks who are interested in animals and animal theory and rights. I think you're exactly right. But let's turn to your quote now and, and see what you have to say with that. Sure. So I, I picked a quote from the philosopher, the late philosopher Iris Baron Young. And part of the context of the quote is that in the book, in the war against animals, I never actually defined domination as a concept. And I think that this is potentially a problem. Maybe if I release another version of the book, I might include it. A lot of the book, The War Against Animals, was written, influenced by the French philosopher Michel Foucault. But if I was going to be pressed to come up with a definition of domination, I would actually say Iris Marion Young provides the best definition in my view. So here, here is the quote. Domination consists in institutional conditions which inhibit or prevent people from participating in determining their actions, 
or the conditions of their actions. Persons live within structures of domination if other persons or groups can determine without reciprocation the conditions of their action, either directly or by virtue of the structural consequences of their actions, end quote. And that quote is taken from Justice and the Politics of Difference. And to me, it's really interesting to apply to animals in that I would say that most of our systems of, or, or structures of relations with animals exert an absolute domination in the, the terms that Iris Marion Young has laid out, i.e. remove any capacity for animals to have any say in how they live their lives or, or reciprocate in a way that is in any way equivalent to the way that we get to determine how they live their lives. That's a, that's a fascinating definition, and I, I can see why you would have had the caveat at the beginning that you rely a lot on Foucault, and then you've got her, because I think this is quite a different understanding of domination to Foucault, because I, I know that, for, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're definitely a much, you know Foucault far, far deeper than I, and anyone who's interested in Foucault and animals should definitely check out the, the book that you edited on Foucault and animals. It, helped me a great deal in my PhD work, and I think it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of scholarship. But So correct me if I'm wrong, but for Foucault, domination is almost where power ends. Domination is when someone has no ability to respond. And for him, there is actually very few instances of domination, because even coming back to the cow and the shoot, a cow that's able to resist going to the shoot, even that resistance, even if it doesn't end in the outcome that the cow would want, that's a form of power relation. It's a domineering power relation, but it's a form of power relation because the cow can respond. The cow has some form, even a very limited form of resistance available to them. But domination, there is no ability to act. Is that how Foucault thinks of domination? So we, we might have to have a disagreement here. So I'm open to being wrong about it. My, my understanding is Foucault... Not that I'm aware of. Maybe, some, again, someone may correct me. I'm not aware that Foucault has a consistent definition of domination, or at least in the way that Iris Marion Young has laid out a very clear, consistent definition. So domination is, for Foucault, one of the goals of power. It's not the only goal, but one of the goals of power. I would say that Foucault almost, almost certainly would resist the idea that a complete state of domination is possible where the object of domination cannot resist. So I think Foucault would remind us that even in extreme, extreme relations of power that, it's, that appear one directional where the, the subject or the object of power appears not able to move or resist, that even in those situations there is some play, so there is some relation of power going on. So that would be my view, my reading of Foucault. But again, I might be wrong. So someone might have, have a different view about it. That's, that's, what, that's what I understood as myself. So maybe I just didn't reference it or, or say it in the, the same way. But yeah, that there's, there's almost always a potential for resistance because at the moment that resistance, the moment that there is no opportunity for resistance, it's no longer a power relation. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think... Yeah, so I think the difference would be that I don't think Foucault would think there's a pure state of domination out there. I don't think he would say that the goal, the, the fantasy of power is something like that, is this sort of absolute form of domination. But whether this is actually real, so what we call domination is, is typically sort of this interplay. The one thing I'd say, though, is that I think Iris Marion Young's definition works really well with Foucault because it tells us what the goal is what what is the goal of those relations and it syncs very well with the way that Foucault would describe modern the modern context of power particularly disciplinary power and, and governmentality which they do aim at a kind of domination but often through circuitous means or, or sort of surroundabout means to actually get to it so I think I think there's something compatible so I'm not, I'm not aware, I assume there's some people who have written about this, I, I'm not aware of anything that I can pull off the shelf that says here's a very clear line between Foucault and Iris Marion Young on this question, except to say that, of course, Iris Marion Young was reading Foucault. What I really like about the definition you gave, though, is that it, it did feel, it felt quite tangible in terms of how 
she was defining domination there because it, it spoke to a lot of what we've spoken about today in terms of the the ability to make a choice, the ability to move. What is the goal? I think this speaks, like you said, nearing the end here, is when you start to apply that to thinking about animals and a variety of different animals. I think our conversation today has really shown that the violences inflicted on and experienced by animals are not uniform. And they, they have a whole host of different structural, you know, we've spoken about capital, but there's care economies, there's a whole bunch of different interests at play and how animals experience those violences are not uniform or standardized. So even just speaking about animals and violence is tricky terrain because the orangutan I mentioned and the cow you mentioned, they're both experiencing violence and, and are those structures connected? Likely, probably, but how they play out in different spaces is is a something that we need to inquire, right? As scholars, as as people interested in animals, and I think that you've really helped us today to show how being direct and focused on violence is an important way of framing that. For me, as a, as a kind of emerging animal study scholar, I'm sometimes cautious of using violence. Coming again to what we were talking about, critical animal study scholars, I think often they're not afraid of speaking explicitly about violence, but I do sometimes find myself cautious and worried about how the animal studies world will respond to me saying that animals are experiencing violence because it's not always receptive to that. But maybe there are more and more journals that that I think would appreciate it. Well, I'll just say that there's a political imperative to use the word violence, but it's it's complex. And to, to give you an example, I I do, apart from working on animals, I do work in the disability rights space and largely around violence experienced by people with disability. And in some of that work, I get a lot of pushback for using the word violence. And the scholars I work with also receive this pushback because there are institutions that would prefer other words, like care, (laughs) to describe what I would plainly call forms of coercion and violence. This tells us that, of course, what is described as as violence is political or ideological, but this also places emphasis on maybe our responsibility to actually use this word when it is called upon to use it. And from my perspective, that's why I've been happy to use the word, although I've also experienced a lot of pushback around that use of the word violence. How would we know if something is not violent? You know, is is there is there a, a threat here of seeing everything as violent and then it losing some of its analytical prowess or its its powerfulness? You know, I, I think you've spoken about coercion, ability to respond. I think, you know, when you said that someone being able to kind of completely control you, you've entered the world of violence. But how would you know if something is not violent? Or, or do we run the risk of just kind of pathologizing everything as being violent? Well, that, that's potentially a danger, and some have suggested that's a danger. But if we think about it, the first thing we do in, in a human society, the first thing we do to verify if something is violence is ask the victim of violence. To, is what you experience violence? Now, I'd say that one of the tensions with violence is that maybe sometimes the victim of violence may not be able to tell you that they've experienced violence. Right? So this is always a problem. And we have to deal with that problem. However, you might say to me, well, animals can't tell us that they're experiencing violence. Part of my work is to highlight that actually lots of the ways that we treat animals and some of the technologies we use to engage with animals reveal that we're well aware that animals would prefer not to have these relations. So lots of my work on resistance and the development of technologies by animal agriculture to deal with the resistance of animals tells us directly when we look at those instruments that animals would prefer not to engage in the ways that we would like them to engage. So I gave that example of the curved corral. The development of the curved corral tells us directly that animals did not want to walk up the chute to get killed and tells us quite directly. Here we, we've actually just revealed in inventing the curve corral that animals do not consent to this violence. And so to me, actually, that is, that's an important starting point for understanding violence is does the victim of violence actually consent to that relation? Because if, if they consent to the relation, then maybe it is not violence. I, would, I don't want to say that's universal because 
there might be cases where individuals apparently consent to something that we might want to step back and say, well, that's, that, that is actually a bona fide situation of violence. But I think in lots of cases, when we look at the structure of violence against animals, when we look at the instrumentation of coercion that is used against animals, the fact that that instrumentation is used, a dog leash or a curved corral or whatever it is, tells us that this is a non-consensual practice that is happening, i.e. violence is at stake. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. What are you currently working on? And if folks are interested in learning more about your work, so I know you mentioned Animals and Capital that's coming out. When, when can we expect to see that? And what else are you working on? And if folks are interested in learning more about your work, where can they, where can they find out about it? So let's start with that, the, the last question first. I'm at the University of Sydney. If you just Google me, my University of Sydney profile page will come up and that's probably the most reliable place to find my stuff. I do have an academia account, academia.edu or whatever that, that site is. I don't use it very often. I'm a bit slack with that. But there is a few, there are a few things up on the academia site as well. As you mentioned, I've got a book coming out in, I think it's three weeks, called Animals and Capital, and that's with Edinburgh University Press. In some ways, it's the second volume of The War Against Animals. It continues the analysis. Part of the story of the book was that I had started reading Karl Marx as I was writing The War Against Animals and just became really fascinated about a story that I hadn't seen written, which was exactly what is the relationship between capitalism and large-scale animal agriculture. And so the book tries to develop a theoretical account, account based on Karl Marx's value theory. A lot of it pivots around thinking about animals as labour and thinking through the value theory and what this means. Um, the book isn't a work of political economy primarily. It remains a work of political theory. And that's because, from my perspective, if we were going to understand the peculiar relations of coercion and violence that animals experience, it is almost like the collision or handshake between that hierarchical anthropocentrism I mentioned and capitalism, the two forces coming together, I would argue, give us the face of the factory farm. So the book tries to systematically track that. As I said, I've just finished that book, actually. It, it took a long time, 10 years, and it, uh, but thankfully it's, it's out there. Right? But I've started work on a, a, a new project, a new book project, which I'm tentatively calling Animals in the State. And it's, again, addressing a set of problems that I, I haven't been able to, I haven't addressed adequately. And this is really interested, I'm, I guess I'm really interested in where does the state fit into this story? The book is, I, I'll openly say, is influenced by Catherine McKinnon's book Towards a Feminist Political Theory of the State or Towards a Feminist Theory of the State. And part of that influence is the fact that as advocates, I think we need a more nuanced and sophisticated take on what the state is. How does the state operate? How does, how does it operate to validate and reinforce mass scale violence against animals? And then as advocates, how might we use the state knowing this? So that's the goal of the book is to try and understand that. I'm very much at the beginning stage of the book, but really excited to be doing work on that in coming years. Oh, wow. You do such important work. Dinesh, it's been an absolute Delight having you on the show today. I've learned so much. Thank you for being so generous with your time and, and your ideas. It's, it's been wonderful. It's been really lovely to be part of the show, Claudia. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you've been doing with the podcast. It's amazing. Hello, Virginia. We are now doing the fourth animal highlight. I can't believe it. We're almost halfway through the season. So who, who are we going to be focusing on today? Well... This highlight is on cats. Really, I want to highlight the European wildcat in Britain. But when you talk about the European wildcat in Britain, it's hard not to talk about the domestic cat as well. As the name suggests, the European wildcat is a wildcat native to Europe. The big wildcats include lions, tigers, and leopards, whereas small wildcats include ocelots, the jungle cat, the African wildcat, which is where our pet cats come from, and the European wildcat. The European wildcat lives across Europe and they look a lot like a domestic tabby cat. They have 
black and brown tabby-like markings, and they're only a little bit bigger than your average domestic cat. A lot of work has been done by people like Andrew Kitchener to reliably distinguish European wild cats from domestic cats, including genetic testing and pelage scoring, a technique used to identify cats by looking at their coat markings. Even though the European wild cat and the domestic cat are different species, they can and do interbreed because they've lived in close proximity for thousands of years. Now, often when different species breed, their offspring are infertile, but this isn't true for the European wild cats and domestic cats. Their hybrid offspring are fertile and capable of breeding with each other or with wild or domestic cats. And this is why the difference between wild cats and domestic cats is important. Wild cats aren't threatened across Europe, but in Britain they're critically endangered. And this is both a cause and an effect of hybridization. Because there are so few wild cats, they have trouble finding other wild cats to mate with. They're much more likely to find a domestic cat. And then, of course, if they do mate, instead of producing wild cat kittens to reinforce the population, they produce hybrid kittens, which, from a conservation point of view at least, are a problem for wildcat conservation because they dilute the wildcat gene pool, pose a further threat in terms of hybridization, and don't contribute to wildcat conservation. Now, the European wildcat used to be found across Britain, but now they only really survive in small parts of Scotland. So there's a major drive to conserve and restore the population. But this is where we get onto the violence that you've been discussing in this episode. According to the conservation practice involved, restoring wildcats requires two things. Captive breeding of wildcats to produce kittens to release into the wild and control, in, square, in scare quotes, of feral domestic cats, which are the domestic cats most likely to breed with wildcats. Let me talk about control of feral cats first. As you discussed with Lauren Van Patter on a previous episode of The Animal Turn, the concept of feral is not value neutral. So even the categorization of cats as feral is a form of violence since feral has negative connotations. John Sacaster identifies these negative connotations as pestilent undertones. Jacqueline Johnston describes them as creating, I quote, exclusionary narratives that construct feral animals as not belonging and in need of management, end quote. And this is the thing with feral animals. We don't view them as domestic and therefore entitled to our protection, but nor do we view them as wild and worthy of conservation. In fact, we view them as a threat to conservation, especially when they present what we see as a threat to wild species. Now, in Britain, killing domestic cats is extremely unpopular, but feral cats are still managed in violent ways via trap, neuter, vaccinate, release programs. These programs might be familiar to listeners. Feral cats are lured into traps of food, taken to veterinary clinics where they're neutered and vaccinated, and then released back where they were caught. Not only is the whole process highly stressful for the cats, but it's also an example of the kind of forced medical and surgical interventions which Dinesh was talking about. This could be argued through the fact that cats don't consent to the procedure given that a trap is used as an instrument of violence to orchestrate the whole process. We can also identify the three types of violence which you and Dinesh discussed. So the use of traps and the non-consensual neutering and vaccination of these cats is intersubjective violence, violence against the cats as individuals. The trap, neuter, vaccinate, release program is a form of institutional structural violence against feral cats collectively. And then the classification of cats as feral is a form of epistemic violence which excludes certain, cats, certain kinds of cats from being rights-bearing individuals. Let's compare this with the violence which is perpetrated on wild cats. I mentioned earlier that wild cats in Scotland were involved in captive breeding programs to produce kittens for release. This involves their mating and reproduction being entirely dominated and controlled. You could even say coerced by people. Now, Conservationists might argue that these breeding programs are for the benefit of the cats, both individually and as a collective. But what Dinesh was saying was that care and coercion or violence 
can look very similar depending on your perspective. So we might look at the relations, especially the power relations between humans and wildcats in this situation. Could we consider the cats to be consensually participating in the captive breeding program? Do they have control over the program, over their own bodies and reproduction, or even over their own future? The fact that these cats are in captivity is a form of violence in itself. But like the traps in trap neuter vaccinate release programs, the enclosures they're in also show us that they're not consenting to participation in the breeding program, since if the enclosures were opened, they would undoubtedly leave. European wildcats, unlike the African wildcat, which was the ancestor of our domestic cat, are famously undomesticatable. They're highly anthropophobic and avoid humans as much as possible. It's unlikely that we'd see them voluntarily entering into contact or cooperation with people to undertake this sort of breeding program, even if it's in their interest as a species. So while conservationists are deeply concerned with species survival and with the welfare of animals in captive breeding programs, the story of the European wildcat illustrates how conservation can sometimes sit at odds with a rights-based framework that privileges the experience of individuals. We can stop and ask what or who the conservation program is serving. Genetics, species, individuals, and what are the ethical implications of all this? Yeah, those are really, really important questions, I think. Yeah, conservation is tricky because I have no doubt that people who are doing conservation care deeply about animals and want to, you know, save entire species and can be frustrated by some of these questions about the, the ethics of individuals, but they are really important. Was it Marty? I think it was Marty. Oh, I'm confusing this with the full Madagascar, but the, there was a giraffe in a zoo who was killed not too long ago. Marius. 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 I was close. <laughs> <laughs> Starts with M. <laughs> yeah, and he was he was killed. He was a perfectly healthy giraffe, but was killed because the genetic pool was was not appropriate. And I think that really raises some ethical questions, right? And people always think that conservation is through and through an ethical practice. Like it's it's got a veneer of being um and again, I think it's it's tricky and it's complicated, but when you start to put in tension the kind of experiences of an individual being trapped. Uh, and, yeah, I'm happy you brought up Lauren Van Patter's episode there as well because, you know, I don't know, it's somehow like we're trying to suspend evolution. What if feral cats and European wild cats do interbreed and you've got a different species emerging? Like, is it this big travesty? And maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know enough about, about um, but do we really need to be so protective of species boundaries? Well, this, this is the really interesting question. I mean, the conservation historically has been really concerned about preserving species boundaries, which at the end of the day are just a human construct. But hybridization is how new species emerge. And in some cases, we're really happy to embrace those species, like the bison, the European bison, is a hybrid of, I believe, another bison and the aurochs, which is now extinct. But we're quite happy to embrace that one. But we're very concerned about other hybridizations. Particularly, actually, I think where it comes in is where we get hybridizations of a wild species and a domestic species. And the, the reason that people are particularly concerned about wildcat domestic cat hybridization in Britain is that they think instead of leading to what they call a stable hybrid, like the European bison and, and the formation of a new species, eventually it'll just lead to the sort of complete extinction of the wildcat genes because there are so few left. They'll just be bred out and out and out and you end up with a really diluted wildcat gene and basically another wildcat, a uh, domestic cat. And when it comes to at least the bison, I wonder if the reason that hybridized species is more accepted than the emergence of a new hybridized species is because of time. But like you say, there are probably, will this just dilute the European cat population so much so that the whole population goes extinct? Or is this a, a very unique kind of survival strategy that they're busy employing to continue their genes in some shape or form. Yeah, definitely interesting and challenging. Anyway, thank you so much, Virginia, for, for joining me again. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Thank you.
you as always to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple for sponsoring this podcast, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This show was sound produced by Christian Mentz, produced by myself and the animal highlight was done by Virginia Thomas. Thank you so much to all of you for your work. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hurtenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!